Hello and welcome to The Shift, the podcast that aims to tell the no-holds-barred truth about being a woman post-40. Created and hosted by me, journalist and author, Sam Baker. How does it feel to come from a family with a legend? If you're today's guest, novelist and playwright Esther Freud, you work with that legacy to produce some of the finest novels of the last 30 years. Her first, Hideous Kinky, based on her unusual childhood, was made into a film starring Kate Winslet. And after the follow-up, Peerless Flats, she was named one of Granta's best young novelists. Scroll forward a couple of decades, and her ninth novel, I Couldn't Love You More, comes full circle, this time exploring aspects of her family's history through the lens of three generations of mothers, best spring tissues. So many things in my life and in my marriage didn't suit me at all. And um, I didn't actually have any sign of menopause, but I went to a doctor who said, um, no, I'm sorry. I have good news and bad news. You have no menopausal symptoms. It's just your life. (laughs) (laughs) Over the next 40 minutes, Esther talks candidly about motherhood, guilt, the way women are constantly judged, her own entangled family history, how the onset of menopause made her question absolutely everything, and why now 57, she's happier than ever. I should also mention that there's discussion of forced adoption and Ireland's mother and baby homes. Welcome to The Shift, Esther. Thank you for coming on. Before we get into your wonderful book, let's talk a little bit about just where you are right now so that the audience can envisage the environment that you're sitting in. Uh, Well, I'm at home, unsurprisingly. Yeah, I'm sitting in my study. There's a school behind the window, which has been an empty green field for most of the last year. And, And now there are children running and playing and it makes me really happy. Luckily for us, they've just gone home. Yeah. Um, I've actually spent a lot of lockdown working in a friend's empty house. And so now I'm back in my study trying to work with everyone else in the house working. And it's incredible how many interruptions a person can have in one day. Are all your children there? My younger two. Yeah, it's not really conducive to getting your head down. No. A writer friend of mine once, someone made a sign for her which said, writer at work, please disturb. And it does feel a bit like that. (laughs) Yeah, it would be perfect for me. I'm absolutely rubbish at getting my head down and keeping it down. I'll do anything. I'll tidy a cupboard rather than, than work. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about I Couldn't Love You More. What was the start point for it? The start point... And this wasn't the title at the start, um, was love. I was thinking a lot about love and I realised that even though I'm so interested in love and always have been, I'd never really written about it. So I decided to take three women from three generations and write about their experience of love. And I had so much fun at the beginning just writing very freely about love episodes in their life. And quite quickly, I started to formulate this idea, which is really at the heart of the book, of not just the love between a woman and her love partner, but the way that that relationship affects the love she's able to show to her child and the way that you've been mothered will affect the relationships that you have. And I started to really think a lot about my own mother and something that my mother told me, she was in a relationship with my stepfather for a while. We lived in a step family. It was very pivotal in my life. And he was, um, well, to be polite, disappointing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with everything that goes with that. And she told me many years later that at a particularly dark moment when she discovered yet again that he had been, you know, less than truthful to her, less than loyal, that she was very beautiful, my mother, and had many admirers, that she just got up one day, put on her wellies, pulled a Mac over her nighty, and just got in the car, the van, we had a big old van, and just went and spent the day with somebody who admired her. And I just thought, yes, good for you. Wow. I'm so happy. And I wish I'd done that myself occasionally. And um, (laughs) so I wrote that scene, as you know, because you've told me you you finished the book, that never got into the final draft, but it made me really think about my mother and her life. And one thing that I, do you know, not really allowed myself ever to think about as much as I now have, that my mother used to say when we were children, occasionally, very occasionally, that she'd been very fearful as a young woman, that her parents might have her put away into a home because she'd had two illegitimate children as a teenager. Me and my sister were born by the time she was 20 and we didn't meet my grandparents until we were much older. They didn't know of our existence. And uh, when she used to mention this, I have to say, I didn't know what a home really meant. Mm. And I didn't really ultimately believe her. I thought she was being a bit dramatic. She had a tricky, fiery relationship with my grandparents, who were delightful as far as I was concerned. And so it was only when I saw the Magdalena sisters and I saw Philomena, Mm. and I started to think about it in terms of this book and 
What if my mother had not been the unbelievably feisty, fiery, independent woman that she was and had kept us secret and safe? What if she had have gone to the wrong people for help and that she'd found herself back in Ireland where her family lived and incarcerated in what I now know is an absolutely enormous institutionalised cruelty and brutality directed at women, girls as young as 13, women as old as 14. Anyone who found themselves to be pregnant out of wedlock, to use such an old-fashioned word, Mm -hmm. um, was incarcerated. And it was a little bit like the way that the American prison system is, where they need people in those prisons. It's a business. They needed those women because they worked them for years and years for free, and they ran part of the economy on their slave labour And the more that I researched and the more I investigated, the more so determined I was to tell this story. Do you think your mother had a lucky escape without spoiling the story for the listeners? Because she, like Rosaline, did go home while she was pregnant, didn't she? Yes. My mother is no longer alive. And if she was, I probably wouldn't have written this book. It's too I was raw going to ask you that. Yeah. and it's too painful. And she was a very private person. And I think that she still felt right to the end of her life, the weight of shame that is part of her Catholic inheritance. And that even though she was proud of what she did and uh, wouldn't have done it any other way, I think when people disapprove of you your whole life, it affects you. And I could see it in her. She was very defensive and, and wounded and incredibly rebellious and brave. But my mother did. She went home for Christmas. She was five and a half months pregnant and she felt that she'd got away with it. I play with this idea in the book, personally, as a mother Mm. myself, my wonder. But anyway, no one said anything. And her her first child was born in April. So she never went home again, not for 10 years. Yeah, I mean, as you say, you play with this in the book and the idea that you would not notice that. I'm inclined to think you would only not notice it if you couldn't bear to notice it. And I have to say, I think maybe in every family, but in my family, a lot of people were good at not noticing things in order to suit themselves and their fear. So I think it's possible because sometimes you just have to have a sort of learned stupidity and a learned helplessness in order to you know, my, my lovely Nana had to stay married to my rather fierce grandfather because in those days, um, and I really look at this and I'm very interested in it, the loyalty was absolutely to the husband, whereas now in my generation, loyalty is really to your children. And so I was very interested in that and I enjoyed a hugely writing sort of from the point of view of the, the woman based more on my grandmother. And the power of shame in not just Irish Catholic families, but actually in many families is incredibly corrosive, isn't it? They say that shame is the hardest of the emotions to lift out of yourself and it goes incredibly deep and gets stuck inside you, especially sort of childhood shame. So I think it really is, it's pretty generic. I don't think it's just Irish Catholic families who experience it. But I think when it's actually institutionalised, it feels as if it is allowed. You know, and I can look at, say, my grandparents, whose lives changed so much in their years, and how my aunts and my cousins, who still live in Ireland, how very different their lives are. It's like religion, which ran everything, is just evaporated. It's absolutely extraordinary. Did religion figure in your upbringing at all? Well, interestingly enough, it figured in a kind of oblique way, so that My mother, as part of her sort of escaping, first from her family and then from my father, actually, because she realised this was never going to really satisfy her. She realised there were other women, other children. And so she took us, as I have documented in my first novel, Hideous Kinky, she took us Mm. when we were pretty small to North Africa, where we lived for a year and a half. And she got involved. It interested me. I was just thinking about this really in relation to her shrugging off her Catholic roots as she became very interested in the mystical side of Islam, Sufism. For years, she was very involved in that. Even when we came back to England, we used to go to Paris and spend time with Algerian friends who sort of very observantly prayed. So that was my first experience of religion because I used to sit at the back of the mosque, you know, all the men were in front and the women and children were at the back. Of course, yeah. And I would sort of replicate the prayers, which are marvellous. I mean, it's just like the most incredible experience of sort of leaning forward and singing these incredible sort of rolling vowels. You feel sort of quite heightened by it. And then when I was older and I got to know my grandparents, every year I'd spend many of the holidays in Ireland and I'd go to Mass with my grandmother. And I, what I really longed to do at Mass was to get up with the others and go and stick out my tongue and have some piece of wafer put there. I didn't really know what that meant, 
But when I asked my nana if I could do that, she said, oh, no, not only had I not had my Holy Communion, but I hadn't even been baptized. And then she suggested a few drops of holy water is all it would take. (laughs) So anyway, with great excitement, I went back to my mother, who'd stayed behind in England. (laughs) And I said, just just a few drops of holy water. And she became apoplectic with fury, which amazed me. I I had no idea what it meant to her. And I started to realise how very powerfully she resented anything of religion coming into our lives and how purposefully she had removed us from that. It was an incredible achievement on her part, really, wasn't it, to have two children out of wedlock, as we <laughs> as we already put it, in the very early 60s and no money and, you know, go off on her own and somehow make it work. Incredible. She was really an extraordinary person and she was absolutely fearless about certain things and then completely intimidated by others. So she would be nervous to talk to her neighbour about the fact that they'd cut the hedge too viciously, but she'd happily go off as she did in her in her 60s to Mexico, where she spent six months working in an orchid nursery in the Atlas Mountains. And it's absolutely amazing. She just was a very unusual person. It struck me when I was reading the book, it feels like hideous kinky has come full circle because you know I remember reading hideous kinky and that being you know a very child's eye view of your mother and this feels like a little bit of the same tale and yet so much more expansive but through the lens of the mother's gaze was that intentional or is it just how it happened well it's so interesting because if I was to write hideous kinky now it would be such a different book when I wrote it I was in my mid-20s and I wasn't a mother I didn't really take in why my mother had done such a thing I was very much absorbed in looking at it from the child's point of view I think if I was to write it even a few years after that I would have given so much more texture to why this young woman was on this adventure And I think I probably was prompted to think about that because even though the book was really well received and people loved her character, the readers, the reviewers were quite harsh about her. And that caused a real upset in her and in me that they didn't understand. They sort of, you know, would say, dragged her children across North Africa. And she'd say, oh my God, I was at boarding school from the age of seven. The idea that I didn't drag you, I kept you close. I gave you an amazing Mm -hmm. adventure. Why am I being judged in this way when I'm trying to give you a life that's full of, you know, love and colour and inspiration? inspiration. So I think that um, I kept so clearly in the child's point of view, of course, as a child, I had no idea why she was there. You don't talk to your children about why you're doing things. I'd never met my grandparents. I didn't know I had any. You know, I was just absolutely in the moment, in the present age, five years old, and just she was my world. And that's how I described it. So this time, I'm thinking much more about her, completely about her, really. It's really interesting to me that what you're talking about when Hideous Kinky was reviewed, the critics were judging your mother. I mean, now I think about that, that's really shocking. It's symptomatic of the way women are treated in society, but it's also kind of disgusting. It was, it was really shocking to me and incredibly upsetting. And I then felt that I had brought this pain on my mother. And mm. my mother had, in fact, really helped and supported me writing the book and filled in the gaps where I had forgotten things. And she liked the book. You know, she wasn't upset when she read the book, but she was upset when she read this feckless hippie woman, etc. It was a very difficult time in all our lives because, you know, when you first publish a book, it's pretty nerve wracking. And obviously you're exposing so much. And I can take that, but I don't want to put that onto others. I have had to think about how to ask this question because so often I see women writers asked about the autobiographical nature of their writing. I don't think there's any way not to ask you that question because obviously Hideous Kinky and Peerless Flats and, and now this do have kind of strong strands from your family background, don't they? Why do you write that way? I would never use the word cannibalising, but I am un- unashamedly interested in in mining my life because I've had such a varied and interesting one. It would seem perverse not to look at it. Also, when I write, I love to own the story. And however many incredible stories there are out there, I need the story to be mine. So in order to write about the mother and baby home, and as I was saying to you just before we started talking, I'd been watching the Abbey Theatre production of Home, which is testimonies read out by actors of women who'd been incarcerated in mother and baby homes in Ireland, and sometimes the children who'd been trying to trace these mothers. And um, I felt if I hadn't had the experience myself 
of my mother having such a close miss with this experience, I wouldn't have felt the right to write about it. And of course, I do have the right. I mean, I'm a believer that we should all be allowed to write whatever and whoever we want. But I need to feel a link. And so I feel I'm the opposite of some authors. Rather than protest that I don't want to make an autobiographical link, I will sometimes make maybe even more of one because I, yeah. I feel so incredibly linked to my subject. In fact, one of the things that got talked about in the in the testimonies was that women were forced to cut the grass with nail scissors. And I have this mm. in my book and I couldn't remember if I made it up or not. And there it was. And I obviously I did my research some time before and it became kind of part of what I knew. And then you're not sure anymore whether you made it up or you mm. just knew it or you found it out or someone told you. So I like to totally inhabit my stories. So they, by the time I'm doing the interviews about them, I feel as if it's all true. And the truth is everything thing in this book is is an imagined story but of course I feel incredibly linked to it because it could have happened to my mother mm, very 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 close miss I think the sense of judgment really that pervades the novel we know we we sit on or you're probably very good and don't sit on social media but you only have to spend five minutes on social media to see the way that women are judged and men aren't you know each of the female characters I mean maybe not quite so much Kate who is the more contemporary character but each of the female characters even going back before Aoife who is the mother in the 30s to the grandmother Isabel they're all judged for their behavior in a way that you know the men never are and yet in your book at least there's the whole nun thing but then you know it's the men it's the fathers who are the most judgmental one of the things of course that I came across all the women's testimonies and stories and research that I read of all the young girls who were in these homes never ever even if they've been raped even if it's a result of incest their pregnancy oh, just I found it so heartbreaking these two sisters who were of sort of lesser intelligence very simple girls they had both been abused by the same man and they were both there in the home pregnant teenagers and was he taken away by the police was anyone no it was just known that he was the one who did it it was just heartbreaking and there's absolutely no judgment on any of these men it's as if it's a conspiracy against women put as many of them away as we can possibly do there's too many of them and then why are the nuns buying into it because it's almost as if they're honorary men they have privileges Mm -hmm. and they have power and they're going to keep it that way and they're so so cruel to these women I mean absolutely brutal you know as they're in labour, even in a breech labour, even in a labour of days and days, no painkillers, no stitches, they must suffer for their sins. They must make amends for the sinful behaviour, even if they were the victims of this situation. But no, it's it's interesting. I mean, at one point I worried that none of the men in the book were in any way delightful or <laughs> likeable even. And then I thought, I'm just going to write my truth. This is how it seems to me. And this is my experience. So One is... <laughs> there is one that we don't do yeah. much about him because I, no, it's not no. so interesting writing about a really nice man not that I've tried much of it but you know. we hear enough of their stories frankly yeah you're so right it's not their story and uh someone else can write those stories maybe I will one day When you were growing up, did you feel any of that pressure to be a good girl, nice girls don't, you know, all of that stuff? I had quite a kind of mixed messages. The main man in my life, my father, was a very, very powerful person. I learned so much about relationships from him because what was most important to him, and he made it entirely clear, was work. So in my relationships with men, the god of work was all consuming. And so I never felt I had the right to be more important than work. And so that affected me. And that really ran my marriage, um, that I could never say, oh, but I need you at this point, or because work, oh, work, oh, my God, well, work, no, sorry, please. Mm -hmm. Everything must fall behind the importance of work. So in that way, I had to be good, as I was. I saw that if you were good, you got a lot. And if you weren't good, and you were rebellious, you lost. That's, that's what I saw. And my mother, who was incapable of being good and was naturally rebellious she lost the things that I was not prepared to lose I wanted family I wanted to be surrounded I wanted to be loved I needed as much as I could get from everything my mother was utterly prepared to be alone in the world and I couldn't operate on that way yeah so I I think I was pretty primed to be good I read an interview earlier where you described yourself as the one who watches yes struck me as really interesting. I think writers are are watchers. And actually, it's one of the reasons I loved writing this, because my my narrators aren't all passive. Rosaline is fiery. Aoife is Mm. fiery. Maybe Kate is more of a watcher. But I naturally like to watch. I like to gauge. I like to sort of 
find a way through and I'm always looking for the story in it even if I'm not about to write it down I'm seeing the story I've had a I think a really useful but slightly debilitating ability to always see all the sides of the story, almost as if it's landing. So for that reason, I've almost never in my life been able to have an argument because I think, oh, but but poor things. Oh, but they're actually feeling really upset about that. So it's hard to react instantly in that moment because I'm seeing all the sides. I think, oh, I'd like to smash this ball. I think, oh, but then I'd have to sweep it up. (laughs) It's annoying. Do you think that's because of your childhood, you know, your parents, or do you think you'd always have been like that? I think it's a mixture. I think I was born into a sort of triangle of of three women, me, my mother and my sister, until the step family came along. We were a triangle of three. They were both naturally extremely fiery. And I was, oh, I I think we would have combusted if I had put even one single miniature candle flame into that mix. So I took the sort of watchful, quiet and calm role, tried to sort of mediate and soften and make things a little easier. That was my job. And I was good at it. And I remember some kind of therapeutic discussion I had with someone Mm. in The problem is, is you were good at it. So you actually think that's doable. It's never doable. Give it up. But I I kept on doing it for way too long, I think. So have you managed to give it up now? No. (laughs) In a word, I think I'm too set in my ways. I'm always trying to make a nice atmosphere. I think nice is a very underrated word. I'm a great believer in it. Why not? (laughs) That's interesting. I described someone I was interviewing last week as nice and she took terrible offence. And I meant it as a massive compliment. I agree. I think it should be resurrected. I noticed that I blossom in an atmosphere of harmony. I absolutely come to life. And in an atmosphere of disharmony, I vanish. And so I've tried in my own family to create an atmosphere of harmony. And when I say nice, I guess really, I mean empathy and harmony and gentleness. And there's room for joy and fun. And I really believe in it hugely. And when you suddenly find yourself back in scorching anger and disharmony there's no space for you to be you have to be a bystander and so in a way I've created an atmosphere where I don't have to be a bystander I am in the middle of it in my own family I'm proud of that Your father, who was, as you said, a powerful, forceful, probably scorching character, doesn't come out of the book terribly well. Ah, interesting. Um, That is not something I'm aware of because, of course, I'm totally enthralled to him. And so I'm using his character and only seeing the kind of glamour and delight and marvellousness of this character. And actually, the title, which has a, to probably any reader will be clear, has a bit of a double meaning. I couldn't love you more. I couldn't love you more. Mm. I wrote it entirely straight that, you know, he just says this. And it was someone else who pointed it out and said, oh, I love the fact that, you know, he, he could not love her any more than he does because he's not capable of it. And um, and I went, oh, oh, yes, of course. I, I know. I know. Of course. Yes. No, I put that in. Yeah. <laughs> I, spoil it. I was sitting here thinking, oh, no, I didn't. I hadn't noticed that either. And I was um, feeling terribly stupid. Um, but you're yes, you're now you say that I just think, oh, of course, that's really clever. You know, the minute I said that he didn't come out of it terribly well, I did immediately start thinking, oh, but is he a victim? of society in just a different way and like no he's the grown-up he's the powerful figure yeah well when I was writing about Felix Lichtman who is based pretty obviously to anyone who knows about my father and my life on my father a bohemian artist um, who's older than the than Rosaline the young woman he meets you see what I'm also writing about I'm writing about love and desire and passion which is no doubt he possesses but I'm also writing about someone who's completely driven by their need to be creative and it was one of the other themes in the book is how men are allowed to be absolutely mm. creative and still have children still have a completely full life whereas Kate who is also an artist she can be creative but she has to stop at three to run and collect her child from school <laughs> Then there's many days and nights where she can't work because she's dealing with everything else. And her creativity has to become kind of subverted inside her as she tries to find a way to express it without, you know, being branded an unfit mother, really. There are very few successful female artists with children, so few. And there's a real reason for it. It's incredibly hard to be a a great artist without giving everything you have to it. And I understand that, being, you know, my, my father's daughter and admiring him and being inspired by him. And I always wanted to be creative myself, but I always wanted everything else. And I knew I would never be someone who worked 20 hours a day you know I would be prepared to have much less and more so I saw it for what it was and I was interested in describing that in my book so you consciously 
made a decision that whilst you wanted to be creative, you knew that there would be sacrifices to, to be made to have the family that you wanted to have? Yes. I didn't really think of them as sacrifices because I wanted my family as much or if not more to be created. Mm. I wanted both the things so badly. I think writing is something you can do both of, actually. Maybe painting, you need to lose yourself in a 24-hour way. But with writing, you know, after five or six hours, there's nothing more I can do. I'm happy to stop. You know, that kind of classic phrase, the pram in the hole. How did that affect your work? Did it affect it? Yes and no. I was writing my third novel when I became pregnant the first time, and I'd only ever really been able to write at that point for about three hours a day. I asked the family next door who had young children if my little boy could go to their nanny, who was right next door, uh, for three hours every morning. So it seemed absolutely marvellous. What I'd managed to forget in this moment was I was already absolutely exhausted. And when I used to write in the past, I would then sort of lie down for a few hours to recover. But anyway, by the time I finished that third novel, I was on the floor with exhaustion. <laughs> <laughs> I just had no idea that it wasn't just writing you had to put into the equation. It was recovery time. But I did feel guilty, and that's just built into women. Why do we feel so guilty at not being with them all the time, even though I desperately had to write? But as, as the years went by, and especially when I had my third child, it seems absolutely insane to admit it, I felt I had the right to have someone all day and then my life became much easier I thought I've got three children now surely I don't have to send someone home at lunchtime yes I need the whole day so did you do the bulk of the childcare? Yes, my husband is an actor, so the god of work I mean, you know, yeah. if he had to go away for six months somewhere who was I to say, oh, maybe another Robert De Niro film will come along I mean, the idea of him being disappointed or missing out I couldn't have borne it so he worked and um, I did the bulk of the childcare your parents' relationship had a, and it, I mean, all of us are really influenced by our parents' relationships because you've written so extensively about it. You can really see that impact on your relationships. So much. And also, you know, as you get older, you do really, you realise, I, I did quite a lot of work um, before I met my husband in order to have a, a really healthy relationship. I did some therapy and I was really determined, you know, not to sort of fall into being with absent men, et cetera, et cetera. And I was really proud of myself for a long time. It took me a long time to realise, oh, I've just fallen into it and it did a slightly different angle. I don't think that's uncommon, really. But um, you and your husband split up fairly recently, didn't you? And it's been really interesting when I was researching the book for The Shift and speaking to women on the podcast, so many of them, you know, long, very long term relationships have come to an end, you know, in their 50s, or they have expressed a strong wish for them to come to an end. Um, those ones tended to be more anonymous. Why do you think that is? Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Um, I wonder if it's something to do with menopause. When my mother went through her menopause, which coincided with hideous kinky coming out, she was in her late 40s. And um, I watched her really suffering the sort of the feeling that people had judged her. She had been so incredible at moving on from painful things in her life. And she got these repetitive thoughts and she couldn't stop. And then she took some HRT and she said it was like suddenly someone had put salt onto the meat. She was just so soothed. And I remember thinking, I'm sure that'll never happen to me. I'll, be, I'll sail through my <laughs> menopause because because I'll have sorted everything out so there'll be nothing to grab me and surprise me. But if I ever do, I will um, get help because I saw how in so much pain she was and how she came out of it. So as I headed for my uh, late 40s, of course, my smugness came up and whacked me over the head. And I started to feel at the complete mercy of my repetitive thinking. I couldn't sleep. I felt so anguished by the lack of control I realised I actually had on my life and how so many things in my life and in my marriage didn't suit me at all. And um, I didn't actually have any sign of menopause, but I went to a doctor who said, um, no, I'm sorry. I have good news and bad news. You have no menopausal symptoms. It's just your life. <laughs> Because she, oh. I, she, she said, well, tell me about your life. I said, oh, well, you know, I've lost both my parents. My marriage is very difficult. Da, 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 da. And then she said, no, no menopausal symptoms. You've just got a shit life. And I was really shocked. By it. I was so shocked by it. And I kind of kept persevering with going to see people saying it must be lack of estrogen or more, too much or something. Yeah. And eventually I did take some progesterone as we're on the shift. I feel I should be totally open. Bioidentical hormones, which are meant to be slightly better for you. And if they are, or just more expensive. Yeah, and both maybe. I was very, very quickly, I was able to control my thoughts. I was able to sleep. And I still felt pretty much the same, unfortunately. It was like my eyes opened. I thought, this just doesn't suit me. I don't know if it ever did. I didn't use to mind. And now I just know it doesn't. And so I inveigled my way out. 
See, I think that was menopause. And I think the idea that if we aren't having a hot flush, it doesn't count. Yeah. You know, time and again, I hear women talk about, and I call, we're kind of calling them mental health symptoms, but really they're a whole phalanx of things, you know, lack of confidence, anxiety, like the repetitive thinking, the foggy brains, and they all seem to be this stage and also this, you know, point of turning around and going, do you know what, I don't think this suits me yeah. anymore. Or as you say, if it ever did, I mean, whether it's a relationship or a job or, a, you know, whatever. I know. I mean, what people don't say about the menopause is it's absolutely fantastic in so many ways. For me, it shone a light absolutely into the centre of my world and said, wake up, you don't keep needing to be so amenable and that I could actually really think that I could have what I need and what, what I want and what would suit me. It wasn't asking too much. It was a really amazing thought and it was absolutely terrifying as well because, of course, when you gain, you lose. It took me a long, long time, I must say, and I tried everything to, um, you know, work on myself so that I didn't have to look to anyone else's responsibility. But then all the work I did on myself also showed me that I needed a break after, you know, 25 years or so. I'd done well. And uh, I feel um, that once I got through that, that certainly the last four years or so have been absolutely marvellous. So. Was it a revelation putting yourself first like that? I think it was a revelation being honest. The thing is, you don't mm. know you're not being honest till you suddenly wake up and realise your whole body is screaming with your dishonesty. You just don't know until then. The thing is, in some ways, I put myself first because I did have what I wanted. I really, really wanted a family. I was sort of prepared to pay almost any price for having one. And um, I really wanted to have time to write. And I was able to do that. So I was incredibly grateful and happy. And that kept me going for years and years. But then I don't know, it occurred to me that I was very lonely and that it would be incredible to actually also have a companion. And someone I could sort of trust really it was just I guess your priorities shift mm. do you think the urge to have a family that that was the overwhelming thing that you wanted do you think that was because of your childhood you know your peripatetic childhood you're having quite a lot of half brothers and sisters the you know the not having the one fixed point so fascinating I I don't feel I've changed so very much in my whole life. I always wanted to have children. I remember even being about three or four and sort of thinking about how much fun it would be to have my own children. And my daughter was exactly the same. She used to leaf through baby catalogues. I thought she was ticking the clothes, but it was the babies. I want that one. And then she would be like, when are you going to have another one? And she was so happy when I had our last child because she was five, six years older than him. So she could sort of baby him as I had babied my younger half-brother. I just think some people, you're sort of born with certain characteristics and I I always knew that I wanted to have three children and I was determined to get them, even if it was, you know, not necessarily what, you know, was the most straightforward thing in my life to achieve. I don't know. I don't know how much it has to do with family because, you know, I can look at all my other brothers and sisters and they want all sorts of different things. We've had similar and dissimilar upbringings. You're very close to Bella, your sister, aren't you? Yes. Has that been one of the formative relationships in your life, would you say? Yes, it's sometimes it's felt almost as if we were twins in two different sides of a twin because we did really need to cling together because it felt quite precarious when we were young. It felt as if I needed I needed to have the security of being very close with my sister. But I also felt extremely close with my mother and as mm. later years with my father. I, I'm not really a group person. I like to be very close with one person at a time. Mm. That's my ideal relationship, sort of one-to-one. -one. Get a bit lost in a group. Yeah, I know. I, I feel exactly the same. And I often find, you know, the kind of the big groups of friends, for instance, I almost find that a bit of a tyranny. Yes. Like it's something that I'm not good at, you know. Yeah. So it's, it becomes a pressure rather than enjoyable. I don't know if that makes sense. It certainly does completely. I feel the same. I try, but uh, it doesn't come naturally to me. I don't feel I can be really myself. Years ago, when I was still acting, I was cast in an advert for Bernie Inn. Me and two other actresses went over to a film studio and uh, the director said, OK, there were, there were three girls and three boys who we were all in our early 20s. And uh, the other two girls were actually Gina Bellman and Leah Williams. And he said to Gina, so you are the, the girlfriend of like the most popular boy. Then he said to Leah, you're um, the coolest girl in the gang. And then he looked at me and he sort of creased his eyes and he said, you're the one who kind of went off to university and lost touch with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and I just laughed so much. I was like, yes, that is who I am. That is you. And yeah, I am that person too. <laughs> so funny.
<laughs> What's your um, approach to aging? How do you feel about it? Hmm. How do I feel? Uh, denial, possibly, maybe. My <laughs> first thing comes to mind. I try not to engage with it that much just at the moment. <laughs> Oh, no, I don't blame you. It's really interesting, isn't it? I was just thinking about it in relation to your career. I mean, you've written nine novels and you were in your late 20s. You were one of those kind of grants of great hopes, weren't you, which you've absolutely delivered on. You know, men are allowed to be eminence gris, aren't they? Or mm. gris or however you're meant to pronounce it. <laughs> How do you feel about being like a literary grand dame? Oh, gosh, I'd love that. Um, I don't think I am. Um, maybe that will happen. I don't know. I, I feel as if my last book came out in 2014, and this is, you know, six, seven years later. I spent a lot of time in the intervening years writing a play, which, which was put on, and that was just meant to take a year, and it ended up spreading out into a few years, and it made this book take a long time. So for the first time in my writing career, I've been aware that, oh, I haven't put a book out every three years, and it has sort of induced a certain anxiety of like, oh, has everyone forgotten who I am? You know, have I fulfilled my promise? It's set I couldn't have done it any other way. I also had to remind myself I, you know, was having a huge life change and moving house and getting divorced and you know, I met someone new and keeping my children steady and all of those things worth so much. So I haven't really been thinking of my place in the literary world, much more my place in my own world has been the thing that's really been on my mind. I remember there was a, you know, maybe seven years ago or so I felt, gosh, on paper, I'm successful, but in my own life, I feel like a failure because I'm so unhappy. And now I feel happy. And so for me, that's a success. And I would always judge it like that. I think that's absolutely wonderful. I think you couldn't get better than that. I'm going to ask you the questions that I always ask. What's your emotional age? For years and years, I was 37. I think I might choose 51. That's when I started to become happy again. I feel very affectionate to that age. That's really good. What's a book that's meant a lot to you or that you would push on other people or just a, a book recommendation? Gosh, it's always hard to think of a book recommendation when there are so many books that I love. I quite often as a gift give the summer book by Turf Janssen because mm. it's such a, I wrote an introduction for it and um, it's, a, it's a book about being where you are, looking right down at what's in front of your feet, which in their case is often some very unusual moss that must not be stepped on more than three times or it won't bounce back. And uh, it's full of wisdom and laughter and just beautiful, strange and rather mysterious things. I've actually got that edition with your intro and you've made me want to go and hunt it out. What piece of advice would you give younger women? It's funny, I'm really torn by being patient and being impetuous because actually, don't be too patient. You've got to do the things right there and then. And you can always, there's plenty of time to change and remedy your mistakes. Did you follow your own advice? Yes, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to wait around. What's your superpower? What, what, you wish what I would absolutely love and I feel like would really transform my life is to be able to be totally self-expressed to say what I need to say at the time and not a year later. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, you are nearly every woman on the planet, I think. Yeah, banish resentment, basically, that way. Have you got better at that? A little bit. I have worked really hard on it. And yes, I would say maybe a day later now, maybe a week, not so much simmering. Have you got any old bird role models, older women who inspire you or you'd you like know, to be when you grow up? I do. I actually have a few older women who I, I really love spending time with older women, partly because they, they kind of recreate for me the close relationship I have with my mother. So there's a, a wonderful friend of mine, a writer called Hanan Al-Sheikh, and she is so effortlessly joyful and light-hearted and without being kind of saccharine in any way I've just never ever known her even have one negative thought or emotion and she just wow. bears this beauty and also every time I see her she's dressed almost like a little girl dressed up in the most beautiful and extraordinary and unusual clothes so she is someone who she makes me excited about being in my early 70s as she is. You know, she's just amazing. She sounds brilliant. Are you a dresser upper? I, I like to sort of transform myself. So I'll be very down dressed when I'm working so I can kind of almost disappear. I just long to get dressed up again. I, I've missed it so much and wear high heels and oh, please bring it on. Yeah, a night, one of those nights out where you bump into people that you haven't seen for ages. Yes, and you walk through the warm streets and ah, oh, yes. Lastly, how many fucks do you give? Great question. Actually, a lot. I want to feel the communication. 
And so if I give something out, I want to get it back. I mean, I'm talking about this book, I guess, because writing is communication. So yeah, I do care. I do care. It means a lot to me. That's brilliant. Thank you for being so candid and just being wonderful. And thank you for writing this wonderful book. Oh, Esther. Well, thanks. What a pleasure to talk about it. It's great. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening. You can hear a new episode of The Shift each Tuesday on Acast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, please do rate, review and follow because it really does help other people find us. And if you'd like to know more about my own experience of shifting, my book, The Shift, How I Lost and Found Myself After 40 and You Can Too, is out now in paperback. See you next time.